Remember, this is only the prelude. This is just, you know, the appetizer for the weekend. <laughs> so save some psychic energy. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sp uh, speaking of prelude, this is a prelude to tomorrow morning's uh, keynote by Stan Groff, and he also has a second talk coming tomorrow. So um, we'll get a sense of, a preview at least of Stan Groff. Again, this is located about at the idea gen level, and I want to talk about using psychedelic ideas as a type of psychocriticism that is understanding and interpreting um, per works of art. But let me give you the spoiler alert. Um, you're never going to get a, ch a chance to see the movie Snow White again without hearing this about this. And I know this from my students. A couple years ago, I went to the county health service to you know, get a some sort of immunization or shot or something, and one of the nurses there you know, gave me the shot, and she looked familiar, and I looked familiar to her. And she said, did you used to teach in Northern Illinois? And I said, yes. And she said, are you the guy who gave the lecture about Snow White? And this is about a quarter of a century after she was one of my students. And I kept on running into people who, who looked at Snow White that way. So um, if you don't want to have Snow White ruined for you, you know, close your eyes and, and plug up your ears because you'll never see the movie again quite the same. And this, to me, demonstrates one of the real riches of psychedelic thoughts, that is using psychedelic thoughts to in interpret things. I've done um, Snow White, um, uh, the uh, a Mighty Fortress is Our God, which fits in very nicely with this, and some um, Fight Club. You can have a lot of fun with this. Those of you who are teaching, and if you want to teach, have fun with your students, have them read Stone, Stan's Groff, Realms of the Human Unconscious, now retitled as LSD, Doorway to the Numinous, and then use that to interpret something in their own life or their own field. They'll, they'll learn the Groff's ideas that way and have a lot of fun doing it. So here we go, we're into Snow White. A mythopoetic adventure is a po is a adventure into the mind which represents a psychological adventure, but is told as if it was a, a story happening in the outside world. And the person best known for that idea is Joseph Campbell. He points out that a mythological story seems to be happening in the outer world, but actually this inner world of psychological development. And in Snow White, what we're going to be seeing is the psycholog psychological development of a young girl of approaching womanhood and going through a lot of the problems and growth uh, experiences that a woman that age goes through. That picture of Snow White, uh, the book, um, Disney was the first person to come out with a book and a movie that were correlated with each other and trying to make m money both ways. Every time the movie was released, it used to be released, I think it was every five years, then it would be completely off the screen, then for another you know, cohort of kids coming along. Um, there would be a new version of Snow White. So there are all these different Snow Whites going back to um, 1937 or 38, and we'll have one or two slides from there, I think. An the, another way of interpreting this comes from the work of Carl Jung, and um, we'll pick up a little bit of a, few of a few of his ideas here, as well as some Freud and a lot of Groff. And the anima and the animus are two of his ideas. You can think briefly of the animus as the sort of characterist typ typology of maleness and anima as femaleness. And in this young woman, they represent subpersonalities or part of the multiple personality that Jim was talking about. So what appears to be interactions with these people on the screen and in the story are actually parts of the personality of this young adolescent girl that we'll call her Snow White, but she just sort of represents that part of growth. So the queen, for example, is, has more than standard male characters. She's powerful, cruel, and dominant. The huntsman is weak and compassionate and dominated. And part of the problem with this girl growing up is to sort of get these stereotypes, these characters in the right order. So there we are. With the, the, let's take a look at uh, Queen who actually is a very anonymous sort of person, a male sort of person. Um, she is uh, <laughs> supposed to be drawn after Joan Crawford. 
I can't think Joan Crawford would be very pleased with that. And Disney has certain likes and dislikes, just like any other Hollywood people. And uh, Joan Crawford gets to be the wicked queen. I don't know whether the huntsman um, represented a particular person or not, but at any rate, um, this is a, let's see him, he's standing there with his hat in his hand, sort of bowing down to the queen. And the persona is the picture that we want to present to others uh, and to ourselves of who we are. It's sort of, this is the way I wish I were, and unconsciously we often present ourselves this way. Now this is, we're looking at a, a preteen or a teen, teenage girl here, and the, nothing I think hits adolescence better than looking in the mirror, right? I mean, this is ba basically this is what teenagers, male and female do, is look in the mirror and ask, are they the most beautiful one of all? or the handsomest one of all, or whatever it is that they want to be. So we see this characteristic coming out in being expressed in this teenage girl through, am I the fairest one of all? And the opposite of the persona is the shadow, which is those characteristics of ourself that we don't like, we won't admit, and we try not to uh, display. And of course, this is the very opposite. What we have here is the ugliest one of all. The seven dwarfs uh, may represent the seven chakras. Now, in no way am I saying that Disney planned the movie this way, but this is our interpretation laid on it. Um, the way I ran into this is the Menninger Foundation used to have a meeting once a year in Council Grove, Kansas, called the Council Grove Conference, and people would show up there to um, tr sort of, it was a tryout of ideas before they were presented at professional conferences. Uh, like biofeedback, meditation, psychedelic research, were, were presented there, and there were purposely no reports of the meeting, so the people would just try out ideas and get reports from their colleagues about these new ideas. And I was sitting down at lunch, and like a lot of conferences, I mean, you know, go to lunch with people while you're here, right? This is the way you really get things done. And um, one of the, we got on the number seven as being sort of lots of people's favorite number, and one of the people said, you know, you know the seven, the seven doors represent the seven chakras? And I thought, it didn't, it didn't make much of an impression. Well, I got home to start teaching my class next week. What should be showing down at the local theater but Snow White and Seven Dwarves? What should be reading in our class but Stan Gross' book, Realms of the Human Unconscious? So <laughs> it's a night class, so it was uh, almost three hours long. So we adjourned, we went down to the theater. This little town, all of a sudden, like, you know, 25 adults show up and want to see the movie on Snow White on a Tuesday night. <laughs> they never knew what, and we sat together in one, in one sort of clump and looked at each other and laughed and said, hey, look at that, you know. So anyway, they were glad to have the business, I'm sure, but that's how I sort of got into to doing Snow White. Um, Joseph Campbell, who was like Mr. Myth and, and symbol guy, uh, I mentioned before, and um, he was given a manuscript of Groff's book um, realms of the human unconscious, and I won't read this too, but he mentions that, and see that last long, uh, that I'm going to render a suggestion of the types and depths of consciousness that Dr. Groff has fathomed his, in searching his inward sea. Groff, being a psychiatrist, starting with LSD, came up with this map of the human mind, which I think is one of the most powerful maps of the mind to come up. Joseph Campbell, studied the world's myths, symbols, legends, the big ones that last across generations and through cultures, not just these things that are come and go. And, and when Campbell read Groff's book, he realized that they had come to the same conclusion from entirely different positions. And this is very important in the world of ideas. When people operating completely separate from each other come to the same conclusion, that conclusion is much stronger than people working along the same path who come to it. On the left is uh, the current version of Groff's book, LSD, Doorway to the Numinous. He's not very happy with the change of title, but you can't do anything about it. And the right realms of the human unconscious. Um, uh, the first of Groff's books, and uh, the great way of mapping the human unconscious, and a way to understand psychedelics, very different from the type of psychotherapy and interpretation that's done now. Groff is a second from the right. Um, this is, he is in a, a 
church at uh, Prague, the the man um, to the to the right of the the symbol there is Václav Havel, the former premier president of, of the Czech Republic, and his wife next to him, Groff, the big guy, sort of to the left, and his uh, ex or late wife Christine, um, and who's given a, an award that the Czechoslovak governor government gave once a year to outstanding Czech scholars. Um, if you know uh, know um, Good King Wenceslas, this is good in Good King Wenceslas' church, um, which at this time needed a lot of rebuilding, but they were able to have that ceremony there. So this took a place in Prague um, about um, in the late 90s. This is uh, my version of Groff's map of the human mind. It has four levels. Groff, come, coming out of a uh, Freudian tradition, looks at it in terms of depth. So the most shallow is abstract and aesthetic. That's what we think of as, quote, psychedelic, meaning colorful and so forth. The psychodynamic is a personal history level um, and has to do basically with what most psychotherapy has to do from birth until now, all the things that have happened to a person. Much against his training, his clients started reporting what Groff eventually called perinatal experiences. These are experiences in the womb and during birth. And he resisted these a long time, and finally the evidence sort of became overwhelmingly. And finally, after that, he got into the transpersonal level. Groff is one of the founders of transpersonal psychology and coined the word transpersonal. And we'll see some transpersonal elements coming up in Snow White. So this is Groff's definition of transpersonal. You notice it has three elements, an extension of consciousness behind one, the ego boundaries, two, the limitations of time, and three, space. And if we imagine our ancestors sitting around a fire, being peasants and not being fed very well or perhaps drinking some beer that night, having worked all day long as far, hard as they possibly can, and a storyteller coming in, and he starts the story by saying, once upon a time, a long time ago, we know we're not in ordinary reality, that we're in mythopoetic reality, the reality of poetry and, and, and unconscious that comes behind us. And notice the three Groff elements, like beyond the usual boundaries, we know we've got in this case a beautiful princess or maybe a simple woodcutter or whoever the story is about, and beyond the limitations of time and space, once upon a time, a long time ago, in a far off land, we've got time and space. So these set us into the, the feeling, the consciousness of the mythopoetic sense of reality. So we know, and if you turn on the news tonight and you see, um, meanwhile in Washington today, once upon a time, you know we're not talking about reality. So this is a clue, an induction of a mythopoetic state of consciousness like a hypnotic induction. And here's the way the movie starts. Once upon a time, okay, there lived a lovely princess, some, okay. Now we don't know it's a far off land, but the next slide certainly shows us, you know, this is not an ordinary line. And here we're getting into the, start the abstract and aesthetic level of Groff and an interpretation. So there we see the queen has seen the mirror is she the most wonderful, beautiful one of all? And the mirror also is appropriate for adolescents in junior high school and high school because this is the beginning of self-examination where they start looking at themselves. Am I like this? Am I like that? The well is the typical image of looking into the unconscious. We'll see that in a couple of slides. And the unity love scene. Um, the, the prince and Snow White songs are about love. And finally, I'm more speculative on this. Uh, Disney does this a lot. He uses uh, birds and animals as sort of psychic abilities. And it will fit into this. I don't want to make a too hard a case on it. But they do act in a certain sense for Snow White and, and her psychic abilities. Okay, there's the mirror on the wall. Now, the story I've heard about this is that when Disney first showed this movie to kids, the mirror on the wall was so frightening, the kids went screaming out of the theater, so they had to make it less frightening. And it is pretty frightening. And if you want a good fright, try watching this when you're tripping, okay? 
I guarantee it'll, I'm almost guarantee it'll scare you. So there's the scary mirror on the wall. Now, of course, this also represents looking to the unconscious. Okay, mirror on the wall. What am I like? Tell me, mirror. So here's Snow White. The story, she's a scullery maid. A scullery maid is a kitchen maid, but Disney has her scrubbing outside on the steps. And notice her attitude, downcast. This is not a job she wants to do. Her psychic abilities are sort of crowded around her, but she's not paying much attention to her. So, this, uh, so here, here we are, this adolescent girl having to do stuff that she doesn't like. And who should show up? Da -da -da -da! Prince White on his big white animus. Uh, notice the castle in the background. The buildings in dreams often represent the person dreaming. Um, now, in, in, in this case, notice this is a big fortified building, hard to get inside, very threatening, and so this uh, represents the barrier between um, Snow White and the Prince. By the wall, by the way, the movie Pink Floyd, the, f the wall, is great to interpret this way. I really urge you to see it. it they don't, the scenes don't come in order, but uh, Pink, this is the, the musician, um, ricoch ricochets around between those, those four levels, and the cartooning toward the end is absolutely splendid. I have never seen any cartooning like it. Cartooning not in the, the, the humorous sense, but cartooning in the sense of character drawing. Very good. Well, there, here's this prince outside, and Snow White is singing down the wall, down the well. The first type she sees in her unconscious, right? Well, looking into the unconscious, she sees her young animus is in the well. So she's getting in touch with this part of her unconscious. Well, she's flashing on this part of this unconscious, not really getting in touch with it yet. So, and who shows up? Ah, the prince. Well, this is too early for her. So she runs into the, into the castle. But she's interested, okay? Here's a, here's a girl just going um, through maturity, getting interested in boys and sort of wanting to hide behind the curtain. And he sings her a wonderful love song. And she's very um, impressed by this, but the queen wants to be the most beautiful one of all. Why isn't this studly long young prince singing the song to her? Okay, there's jealousy. There's, in Freudian psychology, there's a, a mixed uh, jealousy. The uh, young person wants the power and w wealth of the older person, and the older person uh, admires and wishes that he had the beauty and strength of the younger person. So I've got a Freudian, little Freudian dynamic going here. So we're going to move now right down to the Grof second level, the biographical or psychodynamic level. And um, in this case, we're looking at um, adolescent development of Snow White, uh, some beginning of sexuality and conflict with the stepmother. As a lot of you know, junior high school girls and high school girls feel a lot of conflict with their mothers. And so here we're, you're seeing a bit of it um, in the movie. There she is on her peacock throne, Joan Crawford, calling the huntsman. And we all know what the huntsman has to do. Bring me back her heart in this box. Oh. How do you think Joan, Joan Crawford thought when her face was shown this way, you know? Well, we're, we're going to move very quickly to the perinatal stage that has to do with birth and death and life in the womb. Um, Groff puts this into four stages of birth. Um, so, and this in the movie is Snow White's Flight Through the Woods. Uh, Groff was going to be a cartoonist um, living um, in, the, in Czechoslovakia at that time. There was not, not much freedom of expression. And one of the few ways you could do it was the movie cartoons, which were subtle enough that the sponsors or the censors would not understand it. And one day, a friend of his gave him a copy of the Psychopathology of Everyday Life, which he said he went home and ran under the sheets because of, it was a prohibited book. Um, because uh, because um, the, at that time, the communists were power and the people's uh, lives were ex expressed in terms of economic necessity. And here, Freud was coming along with saying there are other powers.
determine who we are. So the books were in a special locked section of the library. Groff might mention that tomorrow. So here's the, five, the three sages. We'll look up close-ups. The first one um, is um, in the womb, which for most people, most of the time is good womb, but there are also bad womb experiences. The second one with the arrows at the time of contraction, um, but no movements of the birth canal. The fourth one is the period of movements of the birth canal, which is very uh, symbolically rich in lots of ways. Uh, in, in realms of the human unconscious, this is a, a great chapter on symbolism. And Groff's background is very strong in humanities, history, and so forth, and he plugs in lots of ideas. He's a very rich scholar. And finally, birth in the last one. So here's, notice the fetus has a little smile on his face. So this is a, a good womb experience. And um, this is typical, spoken of as primal union with mother, and in our daily lives, our experiences reflect and tie back to these perinatal experiences. For example, feeling uh, no cares, relaxed, easygoing, happy moments from childhood, vacations in beautiful natural surroundings. These are all BPM-1 experiences. I, th I think probably, I mean, just imagine floating in a hot tub and you're feeling happy and everything's taken care of. That's the BPM-1 experience. And so um, we move over to Snow White. The huntsman has taken her into the woods, but he's on the other side of this gully. He's out of the way. She's over in this nice meadow and picking flowers. And it's a beautiful spring day. To, well, the sort of thing that was, that was happening in Illinois as I left, just a gorgeous day. And there she is. She picks up a bird. It's a fledgling out of, her, out of its nest. Now, we know she's a fledgling out of her nest, but she doesn't know that yet. And she puts it back in. So see a nice, kind, gentle girl out picking flowers on the nice spring day. Uh-oh. Antagonism with the mother. Um, this is contractions and feeling trapped. The feeling of trapped, psychologically or physiologically, ties into our own BPM-2s and puts us in touch with them. Um, these are situations endangering survival of body, severe psychological traumatization, rejection, which is just perfect for Snow White, an unbearable, inescapable situation. So if you feel you can't escape and you're trapped, that's BPM-2. If you feel you can, that's BPM-3. So you're stuck. There's nothing you can do. There's no way out of it. That's the BPM-2 uh, series. And, uh-oh, this is not a guy you want to be in a dark alley at night. There's BPM, too. Stuck between a rock and a hard place, literally, in the movie. That's the situation she's in. And she's terrified. But he's not exactly the aggressive male that he's pointed to be. So he says, the queen wants to kill you. Run into the woods. Go, go. And so Snow White turns, and we start BPM-3, the movements of the birth canal. There's great drawing in this. The whole movie has some really fine drawing. But particularly um, in, the, in this uh, uh, wood scene. So Groff calls the synergism with mother. With mother. And unconsciously, th th these memories are not the usual cognitive memories. They're bodily memories. Okay? So we don't sort of remember them as we remember thoughts or remember them as feelings. And sometimes during the birth travel through the birth canal, we identify with the fetus and sometimes with the mother. So that it goes back and forth in identification. And these are struggles, fights, adventurous activities. The movie Fight Club that one of my graduate students and I interpreted is a perfect BPM-3 movie. In fact, a lot, I'm saying most BPM, most movies and um, stories and TV shows are largely bpm situation. It starts off, you know, nice, everything's going fine, then something terrible happens, and then most of the movie is fighting, and then finally it's resolved at the end. So inten intensification of suffering to cosmic dimensions. Remember, Groff developed this map by doing psychotherapy with clients, um, and so when he's talking about cosmic dimensions, he's really talking about the psychedelic cosmic dimension of fear in this particular one of being trapped, wild adventurous explorations, 
and the sense of dying and being reborn. There she goes. Notice the lights behind her. Now she's entering the woods, so she's moving from being just plain trapped in BPM-2 to being able to do something about it, being active in BPM-3. And that's the difference between BPM-2 and BPM-3. They both have um, negative emotional feelings, but in 2, you're trapped, and in 3, um, you can do something about it. You can fight against it. This is a, by the way, if you get a chance, and the, the movie's around, watch it, because this, this cartooning is great. See the tree over here in the background? And, it, and its branches raised like a, as if it had a knife in order to, to build Snow White. And you'll see here and elsewhere roots reach out and grab her. Okay, so that, that, that it's a struggle. Now, look at, look at this picture. This is from the movie. And look at this one. This is from, I think, one of the 1960s books. And the movie... She's really from here. It's just this little branch, or very tightly, very nightly, grabbing onto her cape. Okay, so she's but it's, the 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 fear is gone, and these books have been bottlerized over the years and made less and less. I'll say less and less scary to children, but less and less scary to parents who are afraid their children will be scared. Ah, um, the, she falls over a long uh, log. It falls into this sort of a sewery like a river. Uh, I don't have a slide for that one. And um, see the f faces are glaring at here's the here's a good glare. Okay. See the faces glaring at her. Okay, here's a here's a bad trip, right? And she's having a bad trip. And here's some more. Okay. Now, um, this is a picture from the nineteen thirty seven book of Snow White falling over the log. Okay. And the text has been changed to sort of update it and make it less scary for current views of kids. She stumbled over a big root and fell. There was a roaring in her ears. She still seemed to hear the huntsman crying, go, 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 but she could go no further. She was so miserable. She didn't care what happened. She wanted to lie there and die. Well, lie there and die is taken out, you know. 21st century parents don't want their kids to talk about that. Okay, the screen is blank for a little bit, and sunrise starts. And those terrible, glaring eyes transform into the nice little round eyes of the bunnies and the squirrels and the deer, right? And they're no longer frightening. See, the girl's faced her fear at this point, um, and it's getting more mature and, and being able to face her fear, the big adolescent girl we're talking about. So here she is out in the forest. And um, there are the bunnies and all the cute little animals. And from this point on, they seem to help her. That's why I think, well, maybe those are intuitive and psychic abilities. In the back, notice that tree, and at the bottom of the tree, some mushrooms are growing. Mushrooms start to appear from here on. You can see why I you know, turned on to this when I saw the movie. Oh, okay. They're what? Oh, good, thanks. I didn't catch that. Good. We notice, you notice mushrooms. <laughs> okay, here we are, PPM4. And this is separation from the mother. Fortuitous escape from dangerous situation, yeah. Natural scenes, dawn, beginning of spring, yeah, we got that. Rebirth, redemption, beautiful colors. We'll see this coming up in the next couple of slides. Occasional manic activity, we are definitely going to see that. Okay, what am I going to do? Where will I go? Well, your, your intuitive abilities and psychic abilities are running, and they'll, they'll tell her um, where, where to go. And they lead her to a little overlook across a bridge, and on the other side is the dwarf's cottage. Now, I like, I like to think of this as... Um, uh, sort of making the transition from the perinatal level, she crosses the bridge over into transpersonal land and have more transpersonal type experiences. Those fuzzy objects in the lower right hand, by the way, are mushrooms. Uh, they show up in, a, in a, another um, part of them, or in an earlier part of this scene. 
So here we go to the transpersonal level. Here's some, uh, some Amanita muscaria mushrooms. And when we see the house, which represents the dwarf's house, simple living, cleaning, working on oneself. And remember, the dwarf's house represents the person we're talking about, this young woman going through maturity. Um, and we'll see some endless sleep, which represents going to an even deeper part of the transpersonal level than um, she originally gets into. Um, this is a picture from um, um, Schulte's book on psychedelic mushrooms. If you find this somewhere, buy it. It's, a go it's the golden guy. It's the golden guy. You know the golden book of butterflies, golden book of plants, okay? They turned out a golden book of hallucinogenic plants. And they took it off the market really fast. But there are a few of them around. And they sell for over $100 each. They're just one of these little tiny golden guides. There's also a Spanish edition. Maybe other, too. So buy it if you can buy it at a garage sale for 25 cents. There it is. Okay, so she crosses the bridge over to the transpersonal land. There's some more, more mushrooms over there at the base of that tree. And here comes the, here comes the manic activity. All right, whistle for all your work. Wonderful cartooning. I mean, this, Disney had a lot of fun with this. He sort of has these side productions that aren't really part of the story but are an awful lot of fun to to watch. And so this is the whistle of all your work. Now, um, notice her attitude. This adolescent girl wants to work on herself. And of course, psychotherapy is often expressed as, as working on oneself, cleaning up your act, right? So here we see it in a movie. Now, this, this is the way she looked as uh, enthusiastic about cleaning. And here is the picture of her back scrubbing the, the steps from the 1937 downcast. And here's the same book showing, see, she's smiling and she's got a rabbit half, half helping her. So this, this girl has grown up and knows enough to work on herself. There she's whistling, and this is the famous um, Whistle While You Work song. Well, she's been working very hard, very tired, and decides to take a nap. And... Um, this takes her into an inner, deeper level of herself, a deeper level of consciousness. And there she runs into her, her seven chakras, the seven dwarves. Um, so she goes upstairs and she has to put some of their beds together because she's much larger than the dwarves, stretches out across the beds, and then we switch to the dwarves. The dwarves. They're not working in a coal mine <coughs> or an iron mine, but in a diamond mine, which represents the chakras as they're sometimes picture jewels in the center of each of the chakras. And we know they're very deep in the mind, and, uh, in the unconscious, because here they are down in the mind. So um, they go home, and this is where they sing the song that everybody knows wrong. It's hi-ho, hi-home. It's home from work we go. In the morning, it's off to work we go. And that's, that's the one we all sing and know about. They sing it's home from work we know. And then the shrooms down there in the corner. <clears throat> the Eastern European countries uh, have had a series of mushroom stamps, and this is the one from Czechoslovakia. Um, uh, the Wasson uh, couple were, were curious about this idea. Wasson was an American and married a, a Russian uh, um, doctor, and they're walking in the woods on their honeymoon, she saw some mushrooms and ran over to pick them, he had been taught that they were poisonous and you leave them alone, toadstool, and she ate them. He wouldn't have a thing to do with it. They woke up, the, as, he, as he said, he thought he'd wake up the next morning a bachelor again. Um, but he didn't. And they got interested in why do some cultures like mushrooms and some cultures not like mushrooms. And, what's the, and the, so they started this whole family study of mushrooms. And, they have, and Boston has lots of books out um, some in very deluxe, expensive editions, and some in common paperback editions. But he's the guy who really sort of got the idea of psychedelic mushrooms known in our culture. And um, 
Well, he was actually he was a banker for a Morgan Guarantee Bank company, and because of that, he had contacts all over the world and flew all over the world to talk to people and interview people about mushrooms. He was a great ethnobotanist, uh, and, and started myco ethnobotany. Okay, I showed this movie to Stan. I said, Stan, the reason you're interested in psychedelics is when your mother was carrying you, she was frightened by a postage stamp. He said, not very likely. So the dwarves come home and where they think she's a dragon and they think she's a ghost. There's this big thing covered with a white sheet in their bed and they discover it's just a little girl. It's Snow White. So Snow White nourishes her chakras. That is, she's working on her psychological development. Okay. And she makes them a stew. Um, she feeds them. She's already cleaned the house. So um, she's doing a lot of psychological work at this point. And they attack the food like a bunch of Cub Scouts coming in after school. Man, they have never seen such a good thing. But she's now taking charge. She, she's, she's becoming mature and taking charge of her unconscious. Uh-uh-uh. What? They're just stunned by this. Never heard of such a thing. But Snow White is in charge. So they go out to the watering trough to clean up and get ready for dinner. Cleaning your chakras. There are only six of them. Grumpy won't have anything to do with it. So they pick him up, toss him in the air, and he gets cleaned. The grumpy probably is adrenaline, right? Because the, uh, aggression comes from adrenaline. One of my, or some of my students, when I first showed this, uh, claimed that each of the, um, the chakras, each of the dwarves, represented a particular psychoactive drug. Okay, like dope is the bottom one, and it goes all the way up to LSD in the crown chakra. I'm not sure what to make of that, but they claim there was an article in Rolling Stone that said that. So this would have been in the late 60s, early 70s. I haven't looked for the article. Um, if anyone can find it, I'd like to see it. Well, poor old Grumpy gets washed, whether he likes it or not. That night after dinner, there's dancing. Now, I don't know whether this is mantra and mudra, but whatever it is, she's getting along with her chakras better. That's a drummer. He's playing Inagata De Vida. He's whacked out of his mind. The drummer. It's always the drummer, right? Next morning, he manages, manages even to old, give old Grumpy a kiss. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi-ho, hi-ho. It's off to work. We go, there we go. There it is. So, they're down in the mine. Snow White is still working on herself. The psychic and intuitive abilities are all lined up in order. She's really making a lot of psychological progress here. She's making gooseberry pies. She says men love gooseberry pies. But we've got part of the unconscious that hasn't been addressed yet. What's going on back at the castle? What about the wicked queen? Okay, And we're going to see now getting in touch with the shadow. So this adolescent girl has to get in touch with her shadow in order to be psychologically complete. There, you don't want to run into that in Transylvania at night. And the queen discovers it's a pig's heart. She goes to the mirror, and the mirror says she's living behind the seven rivers over the seven hills in the house of the seven dwarves. So the queen is going to go and get her. She goes down into the dungeon, perfect image, image for the unpleasant part of the unconscious. And there's some really beautiful cartooning. Scary cartooning, at least to me, probably says something about my BPM 2 or 3. It's a lot more powerful than happy cartooning. Notice the rats, they scurry around. There's a skeleton over in the corner. She picks up a book of potions. and finds the peddler's disguise. Those images in front of the ingredients are alchemical sim symbols. A friend of mine who's a psychopharmacologist says that th this means a pinch of this and a, a grain of that. And that also somebody did a little, little bit of work on that. And she picks, makes a potion. And this is going to give her the peddler's disguise. In one of the books, uh, though not in the movie, 
She holds it up to the window and lightning strikes it and electronized chemicals is one of the words for psychedelics. So the psychedelics had been struck by lightning. She drinks her psychedelic. Here's the beginning of a bad trip. She, the, the vortex, the whirlpool, is a typical BPM-2 symbol because you're trapped, you can't get out, there's nothing you can do. Her hands get old and crack, very Boy, there's a bad trip. There's a worse trip. <laughs> there's a nice Disney stuff here. We don't know what's happened, but if you see on the wall behind, see that, that shadow? So we know there's some kind of scary thing there, but we don't know what it is. This is good theater, okay? <laughs> Am I the most beautiful one of all? <laughs> so she's turned into her shadow, getting in touch with her shadow. She goes back to the book. Notice the skull, uh, the skull up in the apples. One taste of the poisoned apple and the si victim's blood were closed forever, not dead, but in the sleeping of the death. But the victim of the sleeping death can be revived by love's first kiss. A beautiful red delicious from the state of Washington. So she forgoes the Snow Whites. O officer various things. The Snow White is very wary of this. Um, doesn't want anything to do with her. This is a scary kind of person. See, her intuitive abilities are, um, are warning her. The, the bird, see the bird di dive bombing the witch hag peddler queen? And they drive her away. Aha, uh -huh. good going. But she feigns a heart attack. Snow White being a good person has to help. Okay, so she takes the hag peddler into the house, and as a reward, she receives the apple where you find you get your great w wish if you eat it. And of course, she's thinking good old Prince Charming is out there somewhere out in the woods. Oh no. Clunk, she's out. Meanwhile, the seven chakras find something has gone wrong with the animals. They're trying to they're trying to pull them back and get their attention. They can't figure out what's going on. Um, so at this very deep level, there's an awareness that something wrong is going on. Sleepy is the one who figures it out. Says maybe something happened to Snow White. Snow White. Dum 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 dum. Back to the rescue. There are the mushrooms down there. And if you're wondering where this forest is, here's the answer. It's in Poland. It's one of the Eastern European mushroom stamps. There are the shrooms over there in the lower right-hand corner again. Doc leads this. You know, maybe it's Grumpy leads the charge. The pathetic fallacy shows up. That's when the weather agrees with the events going on. It starts to rain. The witch peddler leaves, and the dwarves chase her up a cliff. She's going to leverage a big rock down on them. I'll skill. I'll squish the little men. <laughs> and just then, lightning strikes. The cliff breaks off. We don't know exactly what happens, but the Picture of two vultures swimming around, uh, swimming, uh, going around. So we have, okay, we know what's happened to her. They think she's dead, the sleeping death. Oh, little old abil abilities, psychic abilities are crying. They put her in a glass casket out in the woods. Da 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 da! Here comes Prince Charming. He's he and his, his horse and doing whatever princes and the horses do in the woods. And he's very rather eager to see. He's, he's grown up a little. Loves for his kiss, the anecdote, uh-huh. Didn't work. <laughs> okay. Well, it just took a while. That's a slow acting drug, you know. It's not, in a, it's not acute. 
There she comes. Whoa, look at that. Wow, look at that. Here we go. So she's the male and the female are finally united in this. He carries her off, puts her on his horse in a eucalyptus grove. I mean, those are clear eucalyptus trees. You can almost smell them. And they travel off to the great golden castle in the sky. You will never see Snow White the same way again. Thanks. That's it. I don't know if this is the discussion kind of thing or not. Uh, any questions? Or Yes. Yes, the question is, is there a parallel between Snow White getting the apple and the biblical Garden of Eden? Probably. I mean, you're certainly willing to, uh, you know, willing to interpret it that way. Now, of course, I can't speak for Disney in any of this. I have no idea what he interpreted. But uh, sure, I mean, um, I'm trying to, well, the apple, well, in Garden of Eden, the apple, some people think it was an Amanita muscaria, not an apple, by the way. Um, led to the expulsion from Eden, which is a bad thing. In this case, Snow White went unconscious, but it turned out to be a good thing, so, yeah, I don't know. That, I suppose the apple would be a, if you're gonna, an artist and you wanna use a symbol that people will grasp, you know, bang off, they're out there, you know, that's the one to use. Good. They're all dazed. Okay, um, ready for Jim. Your your speaker is off. I'm on. Great. That was such fun. <laughs> and also, it, it it you know where else where else are you going to get a workshop where we talk about Sophocles and Walt Disney both of which were really very sophisticated pieces of work. And what's happening with psychedelics, what I'd like to consider on this last round, um, both a little shorter presentation so we have more conversation about the whole day, um, but to, to look a little bit towards the future and one of the ways that you can pretty well be sure that you can be treated later as a fool is to predict anything about the future. So I will do that. <laughs> but I want to set it up in a framework which is um, what are we all doing this for? Now if you go to Right now, if you went to uh, a cannabis conference, it's become most presentations are about business. That they've moved off of, um, and that isn't true for, for many. The sacred herb has been replaced by um, whether the hedge fund will invest. And one of the things we know is that uh, Products move much more quickly when there's profits being made. So that's not, that's not, so I'm not I'm not how bad that is, but we're not doing that. We're not in that place. We are, I think, more basically um, looking at at what I call the three freedoms, and the question is, can we increase our free our freedom? And I think these are um, necessities of being a human being. 
as we have in our Constitution about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, this is another version of that. Which is, I think we should be allowed maximum freedom to experience divinity. And that any thing that gets between us and divinity is inherently a bad idea for the individual and for the society. So that's a position. Another position is I think it's inherently in the best interest of individuals and the society to be able to learn about the natural world. To be able to discover, to be able to uncover, to be able to create, to predict, to basically discover more of what whatever we call we call this reality. And yeah, I know this isn't reality, it's all illusion or it's a multi universe, all that but we still need the right to not be prevented from exploring. Can you imagine if Columbus had to go and get a license, <laughs> etc.? And also, it seems to me inherent that one should have the freedom to explore one's own consciousness. Now, I should tell you that I developed this out of a way of trying to get past all of the immediate issues about science and double blinds and and legislation and uh, branding and so forth. Hackett, why are we doing this? Why are we not content to simply, in our own quiet, personal way, break the law and appreciate life more. And as I've been talking to many of you who's, who really have lives of service, it's clear that you're doing, you're putting yourself out on the edge because it matters to you and it matters to you that other people should have the same capacities and experiences that you've had. So in preparation for this, I looked at my own predictions, book, um, a psychedelic explorer's guide, and I knew when I wrote that chapter that it was going to really look dumb soon. And that was wrote around 2010. When I read it over, it was unfortunately still about the same, which is that's titled "A Time of Tentative Celebration." And I'd say, except for Washington, we're now at a time of celebration. That that's the shift that has occurred. And one of the things that you notice is it's very hard to find media that is negative to almost anything we're doing. That's a huge cultural shift. And when you do find it, it's kind of dopey. It's kind of, I don't know anything, but I know that this. And they're right the first time. So if we, in 2017, if we take just another look at, at the same issues, and I had a number of them. One was legalization. Now, cannabis is just today the 29th state. Virginia, I think Virginia or West Virginia, I'm not sure, just put in a really reasonable law dealing with cultivation and distribution and basically beginning the process of allowing people to suffer less, to have less pain in their lives, which would seem to me the obvious thing that government is set up to do. Now, recreational is different, and as we know, we now have a, somebody in Washington whose, whose level of ignorance has rarely passed, and, and I'm talking about the Attorney General, the President, <laughs> maybe. Um, but marijuana has now got very big business and very big lobbies, and things are going to are going to continue 
Psychedelics are as Schedule One as ever. But it's easier and easier to do research. And the way I find that out is when you ask some of the researchers, what's the amount of time from inception to actually being able to start? And that time is shrinking, which means that all the hurdles are now understood and that people can move quickly through them and that the government doesn't do what it used to do, which is literally saying, well, now that you've done these 17 steps, ah, we lost your file. Would you start again? You say, well, but that took us two years and $50,000. They say, yeah, we looked hard for it. Might slip behind one of the file cabinets. Doesn't happen anymore. And I mentioned this morning the DEA says we're not, we're just not, you know, you're just not on our radar as a big deal. And if we look at other countries, the other thing is when the U.S. Uh, wanted everyone else in the world to stop doing psychedelics, they said, would you do us a personal favor and sign an international treaty so that you can? Am I off? Yeah. Okay. And a lot of countries are now saying, you know, the United States actually doesn't control us anymore. Because before they said, we're this is a personal favor and we'll just beat you up if you don't do it. But the Czech Republic, almost everything's legal. Portugal, everything's legal. Holland, everything's kind of legal. Or, s or a certain amount of things are kind of legal. Spain, there's a lot of research going on in Spain. They seem to be very open and easy with research. Brazil has passed legislation guaranteeing freedom of religion. And they mean freedom of religion, not United States freedom of religion. They mean freedom of the religions that are of ayahuasca as, as national treasures. Mexico is figuring out that it is actually moving towards kinds of legalization, partly to stop the murdering and the killing and the crime, but also because there's the same pressure. There's the same pressure around the world. Uruguay, legal for marijuana and so forth. Now, here, the AYH, the ayahuasca churches, long court cases. The government fought endlessly to stop um, the daimi in Ashland, Oregon, you know, center of terrorism. And at one point, was talking to one of the lawyers who was helping the church and they said the federal government had 50 attorneys. We had two. And when it went before the judge, the judge said to the federal, you don't have any case at all. Why are you here? Okay? So, it's a good sign. Now, the Rastafarians, it's kind of mixed. <laughs> But Jamaica is relaxing its rules. The U.S. is beginning to have a flirtation with cannabis churches. And on 420 in Colorado, there is an opening of a cannabis church. I don't know how serious it is, uh, but given the laws of Colorado, that should be no problem. If we look at other religions, some of the, the secrets are coming out. Um, there's a wonderful book called The Secret Drugs of Buddhism by Mike Crowley, who is an incredible scholar and also a Tibetan monk. And it's talking about the, the, those parts of Buddhism which were based on and the central rituals included psychedelic use. Um, there is the psychedelic gospels, the secret history of hallucinogens in Christianity, and the author is where? Okay, the author is here and around. Uh, it's a wonderful couple, and um, this is not like the books you may have seen by Allegro that says Jesus was a mushroom. You know those books? <laughs> not not a big mushroom, a little mushroom. <laughs> 
Um, this is a very lovely kind of travelogue of just looking at the iconography and the imagery and the, the, the texts where you see, not surprisingly in Europe, where psychedelic mushrooms grow in many, many places, um, that they were an influence in Christianity in various eras. Um, I have a bunch of notebooks from a wonderful scholar about the use of psychedelics in Islam, predominantly in Sufism. Now, if you go to most Sufi scholars, they say, you know, we've never had that. But plants grow, people ingest, and they also have a spiritual culture. So the, the influx of religious acceptance is increasing. Medical? You'll hear it all here, so I don't need to go into it. Almost all the medical research in the world will be reported in the next three days. Psychotherapeutic use, you'll hear most of it. But if we look at the recreational world for psychedelics, 